From the time I was a young kid, I've been fascinated with the supernatural elements of the world. It started off with aliens, ghosts, angels, and things like magic tricks and hypnosis, but as I got older, it evolved into government conspiracies, media manipulation, lost history, unexplainable phenomena, and the very nature of the universe itself. And that's the story of how I became a 21st century schizoid man. We've come a long way in our short-lived existence, and in the year 2024, we understand basically every aspect of our environment. But there's a lot that we just don't understand, and even more mysteries that have different explanations depending on who you ask. Like Sasquatch, a classic monster that roams the forests of North America. Is it a member of the long-extinct Gigantopithecus genus of apes? Maybe. Is it just a guy in a suit? Hmm, or maybe. But where's the fun in that? The nature of the world is strange, which makes great material for a YouTube video, but even better material for fiction writing, where you can come up with your own crazy explanations for humanity's biggest questions. Well, today we're doing both, because we're diving into the many real-world mysteries explored in the popular manga JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This is a series that I just can't seem to stay away from, and I think it's because at its core it just speaks my language. Over-the-top eccentric characters and colors, obscure music references, convoluted concepts and abilities, insanely detailed illustrations, seriously look at this boat, and a deep desire to understand the nature of the bizarre universe we all live in. So today, in light of the Halloween season, we're looking at the various cryptids and conspiracies that Hirohiko Araki includes and alludes to throughout the series. If this is your first time around, my name is Luke Wilson, and I make educational and mildly entertaining videos about popular TV, movies, culture, and science with a hint of obscure history, social commentary, and existentialism. If that sounds like your thing, consider checking out my other content, and with all that out of the way, let's get into it. Oh, and for all my podcast listeners out there, the telecast has been moved over to a brand new channel called Luke Wilson FM. Links on my channel and in the description below. Instead of starting at the beginning of the series, let's take a look at an extremely underrated ability that also sparked the idea for this video in the first place. Part 6, Stone Ocean, is often overlooked as a low point in the series, but actually contains some of the coolest stand abilities and concepts in the entire franchise. In Chapter 58, protagonist Jolene is sent to the punishment ward of the Green Dolphin Street State Prison, and Poochie quickly sends four stand users to eliminate her before she can find Dio's bone, the first of which is Survivor, a mysterious ability with no apparent user or physical form. In a flashback, Poochie asks Dio about the weakest stand he's ever seen. Of course, every ability has its strengths, but in a standard use case, he lands on Survivor, and begins explaining the story of its origin. In 1982, a group of six hikers were found dead after getting lost in the Lorraine region of France, but upon further investigation, the hikers had, for some reason, killed each other in a massive brawl. They fought so hard that their bodies had been mangled under the force of their own attacks. This, of course, was the work of Survivor, which had infected the brains of all six hikers earlier that day. It operates by slightly stimulating the limbic system with around 0.07 volts, which doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to make its victims extremely irritable and resistant to pain. And when multiple people are affected in a given area, they become obsessed with the beauty of physical combat and start destroying each other. Survivor is active for nearly 20 chapters before its user, Guccio, wanders off and dies, but what's so interesting is the way that Poochie uses it. By releasing Survivor alongside other stand users, Poochie doesn't need to train anyone on their abilities, like what we see with Planet Waves. Viviana Westwood doesn't even realize he's the stand user until the middle of his fight with Jolene, and by the end he's nearly mastered his powers. But what's even more interesting and relevant to this video is that Dio's recount of what took place in France bears a striking resemblance to a real-world incident that took place in Russia, the infamous Dyatlov Pass incident. In January of 1959, a group of 10 hikers led by Igor Dyatlov set out on an expedition across the northern Urals in what was, at the time, the Soviet Union. Getting lost and freezing to death in a snowy mountain pass doesn't sound too out of the ordinary, but if you do the slightest bit of digging, you'll find a host of bizarre details and theories that have contributed to the popularity of this story. First and foremost, only six of the deaths were attributed to hypothermia, as the other three had died of blunt force trauma to their heads and torsos, equivalent to that of a car accident, and were missing anything from their eyes and eyebrows to their lips and tongues. The hikers had also ripped their tent open from the inside and left without proper footwear and clothing, indicating that they had quickly escaped their tent in the middle of the night for some unknown reason. Yet, investigations concluded that they had walked to the next location at a reasonable pace? 
Even with additional evidence surfacing over the following decades, there isn't a clear explanation for what happened. It would take hours to discuss every theory in depth, so we're just going to touch on the relevant ones, but I do highly recommend checking out dyatlovpass.com for the full list and more. Apart from the obvious parallels between the backstory of Survivor and its real-world counterpart, like the unexplainable damage done to the hikers' bodies and their separation before death, there's actually long-standing speculation that Igor's group had gotten into some kind of physical altercation on their journey through the Urals. And recently, this altercation theory actually came back into the spotlight due to the opinions of a well-known Russian pathologist, but because he so heavily criticizes the forensic report done in 1959, let's start off with the official story which ruled that the hikers had died due to a compelling natural force, likely intense wind, snowfall, an avalanche, or something in between. The group awoke in a panic, escaped their tent with almost none of their belongings, and began moving towards a nearby tree line for safety. At some point, they would become separated, with three of the hikers collapsing on the way back to the tent, and two more freezing to death by a campfire in the woods. The remaining four would cut off excess clothing from their fallen comrades and attempt to push forward, but it was futile, as one more would freeze and the remaining three would either fall down a ravine or be crushed under the weight of many feet of snow. Oh, and various parts of their faces would be picked at by scavenger animals. Nice. This explanation was debated for a long time, and critics pointed to three major flaws. The footprints leaving the tent did not indicate any kind of panic, there was little to no evidence suggesting poor weather conditions on the night of their deaths, and the group was far too experienced to fall victim to these kinds of conditions in the first place. Nevertheless, the investigation was reopened from 2015 to 2019 and came to almost the same conclusion, with the revelation that the weather was, in fact, extremely harsh. But once again, it failed to explain the odd behavior of the group and chalked up any alternative theories to the negligence of the reports from almost 60 years prior. Famous theories like an attack from the native Mansi people, KGB conspiracies, military testing, and even a Yeti... The Yeti?! And he's throwing snowballs at me! ...have varying degrees of legitimacy, but an analysis conducted by Edward Tumanov, a doctor of forensic medicine and a leading expert in his field, not only describes a more probable set of events, but directly criticizes the official investigations and confidently debunks many of the more fringe theories. According to the altercation theory, the group engaged in combat either amongst themselves or with a third party, as evidenced by the partially healed abrasions and bruises found on multiple group members. One hiker in particular, Georgi Krivonashenko, had damage done to both sides of his head, minor abrasions to the backs of his fingers, and swelling in his knuckles, indicating that he not only received heavy blows from a blunt object like a fist, but may have thrown some punches himself. And it's anyone's guess as to why such a conflict would emerge, some point to ideological differences between the group members, a potential love triangle, or even like Araki's version, some kind of madness brought on by low frequency winds or even psychedelics. As for Tumanov, he believes that all bodies should be dug up and re-evaluated before any legitimate conclusions can be made. But even then, it may be too late to ever find out exactly what happened up in the Urals that night, as the photographs and reports of the first five bodies, including the positions and state they were all discovered in, were poorly executed, and many skin injuries weren't even looked at thoroughly enough to determine what was a burn and what was a bruise. Another point Tumanov brings up is the fact that the final four bodies, which were found nearly two months later, had a much more thorough histological report done, despite experts claiming that all nine hikers had been examined. The same is true for the forensic chemical test, which should have, at the very least, confirmed the presence or absence of alcohol in the blood, yet confirmed nothing. It's worth mentioning that Edward Tumanov's commentary, the second official investigation, and the Dyatlov Pass website are only as recent as 2018, so the search for the truth is far from over. And I'm not sure if the altercation theory was as popular around the time Araki was writing Stone Ocean, but it certainly holds more weight than the gravitational fluctuation theory, the time vortex theory, and the one where Dubonina and Zolotaryov are run over by a snowmobile. Personally, I'm in the same boat as Edward Tumanov. Coming to any definitive conclusion would be like trying to complete a puzzle with no box and a quarter of the pieces. I do think a fight was possible, I also think military testing was possible, and the death by tree theory, which was still gathering data as of last year, makes a really compelling case. But let me know what you guys believe, let me know any other fringe theories I may have missed, and let me know if you think Araki was truly inspired by the Dyatlov Pass incident, or if it's just a coincidence. Now let's dive into a reference that most certainly was not coincidental and was actually taken beat for beat from a real and arguably ongoing mystery. 
Sticking with part 6, let's take a look at rods, also known as skyfish, or my personal favorite, solar entities. Rods are these big, long, translucent, stem-like objects that appear in videos and images taken of open air. They were reportedly discovered by Jose Escamilla, a UFO enthusiast who captured footage of these creatures in Midway, New Mexico in the year 1994. Because of other UFO-related incidents in the Roswell area, Jose naturally concluded that these were of alien origin and posted his findings to his website. It wasn't for another six years that Rods would gain mainstream attention, which just so happened to line up with the publication of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 6, Stone Ocean. And this was probably the best case scenario. Not only did JoJo become part of the Rods craze as it was unfolding in real time, but Araki got to throw his own hat in the ring before any larger conclusions were made on these mysterious entities. The character Emporio gives a full, albeit speculative, breakdown at the beginning of Chapter 116, an entire two-page spread with anatomical, biological, historical, environmental, and even reproductive theories. In short, Rods began as an aquatic organism called an Anomalocarid, which bears a nominal and visual resemblance to Anomalocaris, one of the apex predators of the Cambrian period around 500 million years ago. But unlike other arthropods, these anomalocarids grew propellers and took to the skies, feeding on the water and body heat of other animals through the surface of their skin. They have little to no bones, allowing them to quickly decompose without a trace, and they have kidneys, intestines, and the males even have cocks. No, that is not a joke. They first appear in Chapter 112, where Poochie gives us a detailed backstory on their origin. In the spring of 2000, a group of skydivers were filming their descent into Sotano de las Golondrinas, a cave in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. But after reviewing the footage, the group discovered dozens of strange white objects that had been zooming around too quickly to see with the naked eye. These were rods, and using the ability Sky High, minor antagonist Raikel is able to manipulate them and attack Jolene and her allies. But unlike Dio's account of the hikers in France, this story is 100% accurate to the first major account of Rods. Sotano de las Galandrinas is better known as the Cave of Swallows, and is a location famous for base jumping, an activity where people parachute off of buildings, antennas, bridges, and cliffs. I couldn't find the original video footage from March of 2000, but online archives contain screenshots and frame compilations that were, at one point, posted to Jose Escamilla's website. These images are almost identical to what we see in the manga, and are almost certainly what Araki was looking at during the publication of Stone Ocean. Not to mention, Emporio's theory of rod evolution matches up almost exactly with speculations made by Ken Swartz, a biologist who had reportedly done research into their potential origins. If you look at the fossil record, there is only one creature that ever lived that had the rod mode of locomotion, and this was the dominant predator of the time called Anomalocaris which lived in the sea during the Cambrian evolutionary expansion 400 million years ago. The creature propelled itself by a row of fins or plates that vibrated in a similar manner to the membranes seen on rods. It is possible that Anomalocaris is the evolutionary ancestor of rods. Using Sky High, Raikel causes the rods to sap heat from targeted locations on his enemies' bodies, rendering anything from their limbs, internal organs, and even their brains incapable of proper functionality. Jolene is only able to defeat him by lighting herself on fire in one of the most badass maneuvers of the entire series, which creates enough of a distraction for Raikel to improperly execute a final blow. As for the rods, they just kind of fly away and go back to doing whatever they do. It gives off the classic Life is Strange vibe of the JoJo series and encourages the reader to rethink what goes on behind the veil of our everyday lives. But the question still remains, are rods actually out there in our own world roaming the upper atmosphere? Unfortunately, there isn't a lot online about them because, well, they were debunked soon after their mainstream discovery. In the modern day, some still believe in rods, but there is a mountain of evidence against their existence, the largest piece coming from a 2006 article off of Sina.com, a Chinese technology company. Rods had been repeatedly cited in the Tonghua Zhenghuo Pharmaceutical Factory, and after some experimentation with various camcorder setups, it was hypothesized that these flying sticks were the result of long exposure photographs of insects and birds. Zhang Jingping, a member of the World Chinese UFO Sightings Federation, eventually decided to set up a large net to catch the rods and prove once and for all what they were. And what did he find? A giant moth. This, combined with additional testing, revealed that rods were likely an optical phenomenon that occurs when a camera's shutter speed and exposure length matches up to the wing speed of a creature in the sky, 
or to put it in simpler terms, motion blur. So why do people still believe that rods exist out there in the wild? Well, it's the same reason people believe in orbs. These ghastly balls of light also happen to only appear in photographs, specifically in graveyards and old buildings, but have been largely explained as dust particles reacting to a camera flash. But how can we be sure that every orb in every photograph is a particle of dust? Well, we can't, and using the same logic, we can't entirely debunk rods. What if there are flying organisms that bear a striking resemblance to motion-blurred moths? Since the 90s, this has largely been the case for Rod's existence, although some like Jose Escamilla claim to be able to distinguish Rod's from other flying organisms and even see them with the naked eye. Jose sadly passed away on December 12th of 2018, and the Roswell Rod's website is now under the care of Frank L. Harewood, but by using the Wayback Machine, we can actually see what it looked like in its heyday. Here you can find blog posts from Jose, various articles from CBS affiliate news outlets, and even detailed instructions on how to film the creatures for yourself. But by far the most interesting thing I discovered was from a webpage detailing Jose Escamilla's journey to the Cave of Swallows in 1999. He not only declared his first trip to the cave a success, but he made multiple additional visits in collaboration with the Japanese television network to produce the first ever Rod's TV special. This special, or at the very least, the footage the crew collected, must have been a smash hit because Rods would explode in popularity across Japan in the next couple years. I did a little digging on Japanese Google, and while I didn't find the special itself... Blah blah blah, Future Luke here. While editing this video, I came across another Jojo Rods video by Psychomon that actually features clips from the Japanese Rods TV special. Don't know where he found it, but go check out his video for even more information on these things. In the following months, Roswell Rods would undergo extensive renovations after near bankruptcy, and by 2002, a wealth of Japanese fan-submitted photographs and even cryptid figurines can be found linked in various places. While I doubt this was the work of the JoJo series, it's yet another American cryptid that gained significant popularity in Japan, the first being the Flatwoods Monster, which we discussed in the video about how Zelda brought Japanese horror to the West. Go check that out. I'm pretty open to the existence of orbs and other kinds of apparitions, but rods? Eh, I'm not entirely convinced. In all of my research for this video, I couldn't find one piece of evidence that totally sold me. I know a decent bit about cameras and shutter speeds and depth of field. I've even made YouTube videos with camcorders that were around in the late 90s. Here, I actually have one on me right now. Hold on. Yeah, like one of these guys. And it all just seems like an optical illusion. But if any of you disagree, leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments. I'd love to be proven wrong. Before we get into the final mystery of this video, I want to quickly discuss one of the most obscure characters in the entire series. Old Man Kenzo, who is another one of the four stand users sent to the Punishment Ward during the Survivor arc. For some reason, people really dislike Kenzo and his ability Dragon's Dream, but in my opinion, he comes with some really interesting concepts, and his backstory references two of the most infamous cult-related events in history. Kenzo faces a 280-year prison sentence and has spent 40 of those years practicing the art of Feng Shui, Kenpo, Tai Chi, Kung Fu, and urine therapy. Every morning. <laughs> Every morning I'm drinking piss! His dedication has rewarded him with Dragon's Dream, an ability that tells him the luckiest place to be at any given moment, rendering him nearly invincible. Fun fact, Dragon's Dream gets its name from a company co-founded by Roger Dean, the man responsible for all of the Yes album covers. I actually went to a Yes concert the other week and took pictures of their backdrops because I thought they were really cool. Then while writing this video, I ran into the same artwork on the front page of the Dragon's Dream website. Kind of a weird coincidence. By simply following the compass produced by his stand, Kenzo can avoid direct gunfire and align his attacks with the natural flow of good fortune. And once a person is caught in his deadly feng shui assassination technique, there's little to no hope of survival. Foo Fighters is barely able to survive by tricking Kenzo with a mirror, and he is only defeated after Anasui reconstructs the flesh and bones of his lower body into a suspension system. This is also one of the funniest fights in Stone Ocean. Dragon's Dream is actually sentient and argues back and forth with Kenzo about what's fair and unfair to tell his opponents. Then there's this part where Foo Fighters gets so unlucky that a tangled up fire hose pulls her down a flight of stairs and into a room with an electric chair, and the hose proceeds to perfectly fall onto a control panel, flipping open the ignition box and turning the key. Don't sleep on Stone Ocean. 
The natural flow of the universe and the concept of good and bad fortune are central to Steel Ball Run and Jojolian, which is why I think Dragon's Dream is so underrated. But for a full breakdown of the science fiction and esoteric themes behind the JoJo series, I recommend checking out my video about how one anime explains everything. It's, it's JoJo, that's the one anime that explains it all. It's a really good end. It's In Chapter 69, Anasui gives a short explanation of Feng Shui, like how it discerns the flow of natural energy from wind and water, Feng and Shui, and how societies have used it to determine where to attack and defend from their enemies. But unlike Feng Shui assassination, Feng Shui is a real practice, and while some dismiss it as pseudoscientific nonsense, it's hard to ignore its rich history and its ties with Chinese society, dating back to around 4000 BC. Like navigation, Feng Shui is thought to have originally relied on astronomy, using instruments like astrolabes and sundials to determine the optimal orientation of religious and residential structures. Around the 1st century BC, it was adopted as an official tradition and, much like its manga counterpart, used compasses to align physical objects to the flow of qi, the life force of the universe. Over the years, it has lost and gained popularity for a variety of reasons, and at some point, it even made its way over to the Western world where it is primarily used for interior design. But by far the most obscure and sinister detail about Kenzo is the reason he was imprisoned in the first place, and his future ambitions after defeating the protagonists. In Chapter 68, Anasui informs Jolene of Kenzo's past, where we find out that he was the founder and leader of a cult, one so influential that Hollywood elites began to join. In the fall of 1969, after complications with the FBI and law enforcement, he would attempt a mass suicide with 34 others in his Florida villa. He did this by drugging everyone and burning the building down, but miraculously survived, likely due to the latent and lucky power of his stand ability. Throughout his encounter with the protagonist, Kenzo confirms this story, lamenting about how even pedophiles had scorned him for what he did, but he vows that by using Dragon's Dream and the power of Feng Shui, he'll recapture the glory and affluence of the days where he had over 30,000 followers. And if you want to help me reach 30,000 followers, then make sure you hit that subscribe button in the face. While the exact beliefs of Kenzo's cult are never fully stated, it's implied to be some kind of religious organization for a few reasons. Apart from the members being directly referred to as believers, Kenzo claims that he wants to be revered as a saint only rivaled by Buddha, and later on he tells Jolene that he'll kill her and become a god again. I could write this off as psychopathic rambling, but considering the time period Stone Ocean was written, the former makes a lot more sense. For some reason, there were a shocking number of mass cult suicides in the 1990s, and although similar beliefs, challenges, and events can be found amongst them, I think Kenzo's cult bears the most resemblance to the People's Temple, which led to the infamous Jonestown Massacre on November 18th, 1978. But I do want to mention Heaven's Gate as it not only led to another extremely famous cult suicide in 1997, but its base of operation bears a passing resemblance to Kenzo's villa in Florida. It's not a perfect match, but considering the pillars, the size of the place, and the palm trees, it could be more than just circumstantial. Not to mention the choice of clothing and the number of members, which is also similar between the manga and the real organization. Heaven's Gate was a religious cult founded by Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite in the 1970s, and is a shocking example of what people can convince themselves of under intense psychosis. They believed that they could evolve to a state above normal humanity, transform into immortal aliens, and be carried off to heaven in a UFO. Wait, that's what I believe. This eventually shifted to a more spiritual, esoteric view on how immortal souls inhabit human vessels, and in 1997, all 39 members of the organization voluntarily, and rather excitedly, exited their vehicles and graduated the human experience. This is not only fascinating, but completely terrifying on so many levels, and I'd love to come back to this in a future video. But what was almost certainly the main source of inspiration for Kenzo's cult is the Jonestown Massacre, a murder-suicide of 918 people orchestrated by Reverend Jim Jones. Just like the events in Chapter 68, the People's Temple had become increasingly popular in the public eye and had attracted the attention of famous individuals from the state of California. The organization began with a positive message of community and social justice, but quickly relied on fake healings and religious gaslighting to keep followers in line. Jones would make friends with a handful of politicians and regularly lie to the public about his practices and the severity of his teachings. At the first sight of media criticism, he moved the entire operation to Guyana and created the People's Temple Agricultural Project, 
marketed as a socialist paradise to his followers, but ultimately serving as a way to further control them and the wider image of his organization. Members were expected to put in eight hours of political and religious study following eight or more hours of manual labor. An increased paranoia from Jim Jones led to the White Knights, a series of loyalty tests where simulated attacks and ritual suicides were endured by the community, with the impression that it was all real. These White Knights happened alongside a legal battle in which Timothy and Grace Stowen, two ex-members of the temple, were attempting to gain custody of their son John. Even before the move to Guyana, Jim Jones asserted complete control over the marriages and even sexual relations between temple members, and upon the birth of John Stowen, Timothy was forced to sign a document stating that Jim Jones was the father. To this day, it is unknown whether Jim Jones or Timothy Stowen is the true biological father of John, but the legal pressure became so intense that it was not only a focal point of the community for its last year of operation, but it was a keystone in the events of November 18th. Just a few days prior, Timothy and Grace, along with a host of reporters and political figures, most notable among them being United States Congressman Leo Ryan, flew to Guyana to see what the hell was going on and to hopefully speak with Jim Jones, who had been ignoring all contacts from the court regarding the custody of John Stone. They arrived in Jonestown on November 17th, and things were pretty normal until two residents, Vernon Gosney and Monica Bagby, passed a note to the visiting party, reading, Please help us get out of Jonestown. <laughs> For many years, Congressman Ryan and others were suspicious of foul play within the organization, and this note was the first and only piece of confirmation needed to realize just what had been going on. They were set to depart on the next day, and only a small group of 14 cult members, including Gosney and Bagby, had opted to join them. As the illusion was beginning to fall apart, Jones executed his endgame. The passengers on both planes were to be murdered, and massive amounts of grape flavorade was being mixed up and poisoned with a mixture of Benadryl, Valium, cyanide, and a combination of other sedatives and antipsychotics. As the visiting party and temple defectors began boarding their planes, multiple guards and gunmen opened fire, shooting Congressman Ryan over 20 times, killing him and four others. Six miles away in Jonestown, Jim Jones had gathered all of the cult members and ordered them to take part in a mass suicide. 909 people were either poisoned or murdered, 190 of whom were under the age of 12. The entire 40-minute tape of Reverend Jim Jones's final speech is available online, and through all of the screaming and panic, he maintains his sinister charisma and successfully completes his plan. It is absolutely terrifying, and while Heaven's Gate is an example of what people can do under a state of disillusion, Jonestown is more about how a single person can create, maintain, and trap their followers in an echo chamber. From what we see of Old Man Kenzo, he too enjoys exaltation above others, but it comes off as more self-righteous than morally twisted. He legitimately does have supernatural powers, and based on his negative view of kidnapping children, he's probably more interested in telling others how to live their lives than anything else. Jim Jones started out much the same, but took it way too far, with numerous reports of sexual, physical, mental, and social abuse dating back to the very beginning. There were always justifications and excuses made preying on the goodwill and naivety of even the most highly intelligent followers, and considering how many legal documents the members had to sign, along with the reports and recordings of Jones over the years, I think it's pretty obvious that he knew what he was doing all along, easily making him one of the most evil people to have walked this earth. While the major questions about Jonestown have been answered through extensive research, interviews, and psychological analysis, the final mystery of today's video will likely never be solved. That is, the motive and identity of Jack the Ripper and his involvement in the brutal murders of 11 prostitutes in the Whitechapel district of East London. Just like the Roswell Rods, Jack the Ripper makes an appearance in the JoJo manga complete with a historically accurate backstory and a showcase of his abilities in combat. But unlike Rods, he's a major part of the plot, appearing in 8 of the 44 chapters that make up Part 1, Phantom Blood. And as a matter of fact, he's the very first servant of series antagonist Dio Brando. He's portrayed as an adult gentleman living in London, where he is seen charming a young woman, slicing her throat, and stabbing her abdomen many times. Apart from his method, his appearance is also based on the real killer, who many speculate to have been a man of high class or education, for reasons we'll get to later. Phantom Blood begins in 1880, and between chapters 5 and 6, we jump ahead to the year 1888, where Jack the Ripper is already at large. 
By the time we get a formal introduction to the character, five days have passed, and judging by the harsh blizzards, increased media coverage of the Whitechapel murders, and the conclusion of Phantom Blood landing in early December, we can put the Ripper's debut around early to mid-November. This actually coincides with the real end of the murders and the sudden disappearance of the killer, so let's go back to the beginning of the story and make a timeline of events. In total, only five of the eleven murders were officially considered canon by extensive forensic, medical, and criminal investigations, but over the years, this number has been subject to change based on new discoveries and revelations. Whitechapel is a district in London's East End that, during the Victorian era, was a center for poverty, poor living conditions, and crime, which only got worse around the end of the 19th century. Women of all ages became prostitutes in order to make ends meet, and while the extra cash allowed them to live more comfortably during the day, their illicit activities made them a prime target for robberies and murder throughout the night. The first Whitechapel murder happened all the way back in April of 1888, where 45-year-old Emma Elizabeth Smith was attacked and robbed by two or three men, one of whom was a teenager. She made it to the hospital and gave a testimony, but would sadly die the next day from her injuries. The culprits were never discovered, but the nature and timing of the attack doesn't indicate that Jack the Ripper was involved. The next murder, while also not part of the Canonical Five, would kick off the Autumn of Terror and is the first possible appearance of our killer. On August 7, 1888, 39-year-old Martha Tabram was found in the early morning with 39 stab wounds to her neck, abdomen, and genitals. While Emma Smith was assaulted with no regard for her life, the intention of the assailants was a robbery, not necessarily a murder. In the case of Martha Tabram, the intention was complete and utter destruction, indicating a more violent and less reasonable motive for her death. This certainly wasn't an ordinary crime, but it was still, like the attack on Emma Smith, suspected as gang violence and largely treated as a routine homicide case. That was until murder number three, which would not only add context to Martha Tabram's death, but would kick off the Jack the Ripper media sensation and send London into a frenzy. At approximately 3.40 a.m. on August 31st, 43-year-old Mary Ann Nichols was discovered dead on a back street just half a mile from the previous crime scene. Her throat had been slit twice from left to right, and her lower abdomen had been stabbed multiple times across and down the right side, with one deep, jagged wound spanning across the others. Although the coroner, Wynne Edward Baxter, stated that it was likely unrelated to the previous cases in Whitechapel, the Star, an up-and-coming newspaper, began spreading the narrative that a single killer was not only responsible, but was actively walking the streets of London. Once again, this was mostly speculation, as there was little to no intel coming from police investigations, but the fourth murder would start lending credence to this idea and begin painting a picture of who the man behind it really was. On the morning of September 8th, just one week later, 47-year-old Annie Chapman was found in a state eerily similar to the previous victim. In addition to a slit to her throat and cuts to the abdomen, her intestines had been removed and thrown over her shoulders. At this point, a single killer was confirmed, and over the next few weeks, the public was busy trying to figure out what was happening and what to do about it. Over the course of September, Jack the Ripper slowly came into being, with not only a witness claiming to have seen him, but a note delivered to the press from Jack himself, which has come to be known as the Dear Boss Letter. His method of killing was also cemented, and a full-fledged investigation was now underway, with both John Pizer and Charles Ludwig arrested and released under suspicion of being the killer. This is mainly where JoJo's Bizarre Adventure pulls from, as Jack in the manga bears a resemblance to a few descriptions and theories that arose after the murder of Annie Chapman. The most notable was a witness testimony from Elizabeth Long, who claimed to have seen a man over 40 with a dark complexion, a brown coat, and a brown deerstalker hat, speaking with Annie just a half hour before her body was found. Additionally, due to the precise nature of Jack's killings, many believed him to be a well-educated doctor or aristocrat who took pleasure in killing women for sport. This certainly seems the case for Jack's animated appearance, and while he never gives a specific reason for targeting women, he calls at least one of them a dirty harlot, and Dio suggests that it's the joy of young women that angers him. But the best piece of evidence for the real killer's motivation comes from the Dear Boss letter, which arrived at the Central News Agency of London on September 27th and was supposedly written, mailed, and signed by the killer. Excerpts include, Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. And, I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. 
But the most important thing to come out of this letter was the name Jack the Ripper, which until this point was non-existent, meaning whoever wrote this letter had officially named the killer whether it was a hoax or not. To this day, no one is quite sure why Jack the Ripper only targeted prostitutes in Whitechapel, but if I were to guess, it's probably because they were the easiest target. Prostitutes were already ignored by law enforcement, whether it was out of pity or to make peace with gangs, and they mainly worked the graveyard shift, making their deaths far more likely to go unnoticed. And Whitechapel, well, I've actually been there and seen the locations of the murders, and it would have been extremely easy to commit a crime and disappear into the poorly lit maze of city streets. It was less than 72 hours before the next murder, and although police were extremely quick to the scene this time around, Jack had claimed a second life within the hour. On September 30th around 1am, 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride was found moments after her throat had been slit, and although her torso was unharmed, it was because Jack had already fled the scene to claim another life. Just a few blocks over, 46-year-old Catherine Eddowes was the victim of the most brutal murder thus far, with a slit throat, multiple cuts of various depths to the face, and one large incision running from her groin to her breast. Her intestines were also removed and thrown over her shoulder, much like Annie Chapman, and one of her kidneys and part of her uterus were removed, further supporting the idea that our killer was a doctor, or at the very least, had a depth of knowledge on the human body. Witness testimonies were less than helpful, and at this point, over 2,000 people had been interviewed, and around 80 were detained. There had been no major breakthroughs in the case, and public criticism had become so bad, the police considered bringing in two bloodhounds to track the killer. Their names were Burgo and Barnaby. Despite no documented murders throughout the month of October, the police did receive two more messages from the killer, but it honestly raised more questions than it answered. On October 1st, the police received a postcard from Jack the Ripper, which not only referenced unpublished details of the murders, but had handwriting and linguistic composition very similar to the Dear Boss letter from a week prior. October 16th would bring the From Hell letter, and although it differed in tone from the previous two, it's notable for including half a kidney preserved in ethanol, with the other half supposedly fried and eaten by Jack after harvesting it from Catherine Eddowes' dead body. While the legitimacy of the letter and even the biological origin of the kidney are still up for debate, the idea that Jack the Ripper was some kind of cannibalistic vampire added a new, almost supernatural element into the mix. And this is the point where we not only begin to see the truth behind the entire Jack the Ripper mythos, but it's where JoJo's Bizarre Adventure begins to deviate from the original set of events. As I mentioned earlier, Jack the Ripper was extremely popular going into November, but it seems as though the murder depicted in Phantom Blood is either separate from or a reimagining of Jack the Ripper's final crime. In the early morning of November 9th, 25-year-old Mary Jane Kelly was the victim of, without a doubt, the most disturbing of all 11 Whitechapel murders. At 10.45, her landlord's assistant, Thomas Boyer, had knocked on her door to collect rent, and after hearing no response, Thomas decided to peer into the open window. That was a mistake. The entire room was soaked with Mary's blood, flesh, and viscera, and her partially skinned corpse lie still on the bed, with her clothing neatly folded on the other side of the room. Her breast had been removed, her face was unrecognizable, and some leg muscles had even been cut down to the bone and removed. The landlord, John McCarthy, reported it to the press. It looked more like the work of a devil than a man. I had heard a great deal about the Whitechapel murders, but I declare to God I had never expected to see such a sight as this. The whole scene is more than I can describe. I hope I may never see such a sight as this again. After the death of Mary Jane Kelly, only one of the three remaining Whitechapel murders were confirmed to be a homicide, and it occurred almost an entire year later. So the official story, according to experts involved, is that Jack the Ripper disappeared after the events of November 9th, and may have died, left town, or simply gotten better at hiding his crimes. But we all know the official story can leave out some obscure and even some important details, so before we see how JoJo's Bizarre Adventure explains the disappearance of Jack the Ripper, let's do a rapid-fire round of some of the more interesting explanations. The Heisenberg Theory Jack the Ripper had a chronic illness and decided to have a little fun before he kicked the bucket. The Jeffrey Epstein Theory Jack the Ripper committed suicide. The Petty Criminal Theory Jack was arrested for unrelated crimes and avoided police investigation because he was already in prison. Smart, smart, smart. The Woman Theory. Jack the Ripper was a really bad driver. Wait, no, that's not right. Jack the Ripper was actually a woman and completely evaded police because, well, they never suspected a woman. The Expatriate Theory. 
Jack the Ripper was none other than Herman Webster Mudgett, known more infamously as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. Holmes was a notorious American criminal who committed a range of crimes in the Chicago area in the 1880s and 1890s. According to this theory, he moved to London, murdered five women, and moved back to America to evade capture. He continued his crime spree but was ultimately arrested in 1894 and executed in 1896. But by far the most compelling theory, and the one that I personally subscribe to, sidesteps the identity of the killer and focuses on the role of the previously mentioned Star newspaper. It's obvious how the Star newspaper used the Ripper narrative to boost their initial ratings, effectively sensationalizing the story and creating the legend, but it goes even deeper. In a 1966 article written for Crime and Detection, Frederick Best admitted to writing the Ripper letters to keep the business alive after John Pizer and Charles Ludwig were acquitted, and handwriting expert Elaine Quigley backed up this claim in 2009, stating, I really do not think it's anyone other than Best that wrote the Dear Boss letter. While it's rather disappointing to hear, Fred Best's involvement is still entirely theoretical, as the truth behind the Ripper is lost to history. But as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, these unknowns make a perfect foundation for fiction writing. So without further ado, let's see what caused Jack the Ripper to seize his murder spree in November of 1888, according to the JoJo series. Jack the Ripper. One day this serial killer decided to stop his crimes and faded into the world of mystery. But Dio knows what happened! A few nights after the death of Mary Jane Kelly, Jack the Ripper murders an unnamed woman around 9pm in Whitechapel. Dio Brando and one of his allies witness this event and explain that they have been seeking out the evil elite, those who are not constrained by even a shred of good nature. Whether he was hypnotized, charmed, or acted on his own accord is up for debate, but in this moment, Jack stops his murder spree, renounces his mortality, and becomes a zombie. Kind of like a weak vampire with supernatural strength, endurance, and a diet of flesh and blood. The next time we see Jack is three chapters later, where he has gotten used to his new abilities and has been helping Dio collect young women to feast upon. Moments later, inside a tunnel leading to Wind Knight's Lot, an English mountain village, Jack emerges from inside of a horse to ambush Jonathan Joestar and the other protagonists. He not only survives a host of injuries to his body, but he actually launches over a dozen scalpels that had been hidden between his muscles. He eventually lures Jonathan into a labyrinth hidden within the walls of the tunnel and is only defeated after Jonathan uses a Sendo Hamon overdrive and melts his entire face and body off. This is obviously a complete falsification of the evidence from the real Ripper case. I mean, there's not a labyrinth in the tunnel to win Knight's Lot, it's a Dairy Queen. It's really amazing to see not only the whole of London swept up in the story of Jack the Ripper, but how the media can influence public perception of events, law enforcement, and even enact societal change. Stories about the Ripper actually exposed the darker side of the lower class that not many outsiders were aware of. I mean, 11 mysterious deaths occurred in Whitechapel, and to this day, no one knows what happened. It's all a good exercise in how our realities come from what we choose to believe, which in itself is another mystery of the world we live in. No one can ever definitively say what happened in the Ural Mountains in January of 1959, no one can ever fully debunk prehistoric flying centipedes, and who knows, any one of us could be placing our trust in a completely manipulative and potentially evil public figure. We can only look back in retrospect and try to make sense of what happened. I really wanted to cover the Kraken, Nazi science, aliens, government conspiracies, the Aztecs, and ancient Egypt, and all that kind of stuff, but this video just got to be way too long, so if you have any ideas for more JoJo's Bizarre Adventure mysteries I should cover, or any other TV show, movie, series, or property that explores or fictionalizes strange, bizarre, supernatural, and unexplainable parts of the world we live in, definitely let me know in the comments. For now, that's all I got for you guys, so I'll see you in the next video. Peace-a-roni. Peace.